as I was walking over a few minutes ago, somebody said, you're going to talk about compromise? I said, yeah. I said, why? And I thought for a minute, I shouldn't be talking about compromise. I mean, really, what's the... We learn compromise almost as soon as we're born. And you start compromising with your parents over how much food or candy you're going to get. You compromise with your siblings. You compromise when you get to school with your classmates, with your teachers, whatever. We compromise all our lives. That's how we live lives, by compromising. So why do we have to talk about it? Because there seems to be a small group in Washington, D.C. <laughs> who says you can't compromise, that compromise is somehow a bad thing. And because it seems to me of that kind of attitude, the idea that people are saying that compromise is a bad thing, all sorts of national problems aren't being dealt with. Many of the students who are watching may contribute to Social Security without ever getting any, because it doesn't work financially unless they fix it. Neither does Medicaid, Medicare rather. Neither so many of the government programs are fiscally unsustainable unless Congress does something. All these illegal immigrants, undocumented people in this country, Congress seems unable to do anything about them at all. And so many pro go program after program, cybersecurity. You know, we're getting hacked government, businesses, Every day as we're sitting here, government has spent five or six years now with the cybersecurity bill pending in Congress. It just doesn't pass. Government is broken. It's just simply broken and so much else, so much we've talked about today, so many good things are going on in this country. And yet unless we fix the government in some way or other, it's not gonna matter much because people just aren't gonna, it's aren't gonna happen. Uh, and what's happened is, well, let me, let me tell you a story. I, I used to teach, you know, here. I used to teach history. And one of the things I used to teach about in a classroom not far from here was about the Constitutional Convention. And we talked after winning this great revolution. Here we were. And then this good group of people got together and decided we're not going to succeed unless we have a stronger government, some system that keeps us together instead of running apart. And so they got together, these people. They didn't agree very much. So from 13 separate colonies, or from north and south, they were from all different occupations. And yet they decided the one goal was worth compromising. So they argued and they debated and they tried to deal with every subject and they compromised. There was one great compromise. They called it the Great Compromise because, you know, the big states, Virginia, New York in those days, said, you know, it really should do in this country. The majority should rule. That's democracy. That's what we fought for. The smaller states said, oh, 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 that means you're going to dictate to us. We're not going to have that. And both sides said, we'll walk out if you get your way. And they put together New Jersey plan, Virginia plan, they called it, and they fought with each other, and then they compromised. And out of that compromise, we got a House of Representatives, which is representative of the people as a whole, supposedly. And then, and then we have a Senate. There's two from every state. And out of that compromise, this country was born. And sometimes I feel like taking these congressmen and telling them, you know, if it wasn't for that great compromise, you wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> wouldn't have a House and a Senate. So that's... That's how we started, and that's why it's so important. And I've seen it change so much, uh, and I've seen the results of it, and there are a lot of reasons for it. Let, let, me, let me give you just one of them to start with. We have a system now where we have something called gerrymandering, which goes on all over the country. Now, what does that mean? It means that you take districts and fix them as best you can so they elect people from only one party. 
And we've got a whole, you, you go into the occupation actually, there's a whole occupation now, statisticians, statisticians and lawyers and all sorts of other people who help states fix their districts. So they're one party districts. So let me tell you how we've ended up. We've ended up now in this country with 90% of the congressional districts in this country having a 70% majority of one party or the other. And what does that mean? It means really that the general election doesn't matter because you're either in a Republican district or in a Democratic district. They can elect a Republican or the, or the Democrat, and that's it. So we got this strange system where the voters aren't picking the legislators, the legislators are picking the voters. And that's not the way it was intended. So, so this means a lot of things. It means the general election doesn't matter. It's fixed for most of the districts in this country. So what's important? The primary. Who votes in the primary? Very few people. And for the Democrats, it tends to be the more liberal. For the Republicans, it tends to be more conservative. So you push that direction. And you add to that special interest groups who can get into the primary and influence people because there are so people, for very few people who vote. So you get the Republicans pushed to the right, the Democrats pushed to the left, and the Senate disappears. 50 years ago, we had something called Rockefeller Republicans, about 20 of them in the Senate. And we had something called Blue Dog Democrats, a bunch of them. These were conservative Democrats and moderate or liberal Republicans. And, and compromises were formed around these people because they were the center. And you form compromises around the center. That center has now disappeared. It's very hard to find one or two people in either party in the Senate right now who fit the category of either conservative Democrats or moderate to liberal Republicans. Few of them, but not enough to make the compromise around. So the system starts failing. The system moves to the right or moves to the left and they stop they simply start talking, to each, start talking to each other. And that's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. And when you add to that the money, when you add the fact that due to a whole series of court decisions, started with something called Buckley and Vallejo back in 1776, uh, 1976, uh, 200 years after, interestingly enough, after the Constitution, they had this court decision, and the court decision, Buckley versus Phileo, basically accorded money with speech. So that said, basically, if you, if you don't allow people to use money in campaigns, you're taking away their free speech. And that was the basis for a whole series of decisions, one after the other, which made it more and more easy to give larger and larger sums of money until now, as you know, we face elections now, not only a huge amounts of money given, but much, much of it isn't even disclosed, so we don't know who's giving it. So we have an, a primary now with all these Republicans running around. They don't really need more than about two or three billionaires. They don't have to worry about the rest of us. And when there's an issue they care about, they can really pump into the right or pump into the left all this money, which influences decision. And the citizens, you know, you and I don't have an awful lot to say about it. But it always militates against any kind of bipartisanship all the time. Now, look how important this has been. With the single exception of slavery in this country, with that single exception, every single major issue in this country in the whole history of the republic until now, was decided by compromises. And people forget that. We've had a lot of celebrations last year about the Voting Rights Act. You know, wasn't it wonderful, Lyndon Johnson's Voting Rights Act? You know what people forget about? There were more Republican senators who voted for the Voting Rights Act than there were Democrats. It wouldn't have passed without the bipartisan compromise that were made to get that act through. And you can do that with almost every other legislative um, accomplishment in our history. And so that's what it means when you don't have a compromise. And that's what it means when you get this gerrymandering that makes districts to the right or districts to the left. That's what it means when you add money to the problem so that huge amounts of money are sometimes what I call a cancer on the system. And they've gotten into it. That 
is simply unacceptable, and a democracy simply isn't going to work if we continue along this line. Now, there are solutions. California, for instance, has started uh, where we have commissions, judicial, with judicial help of picking some of these things, uh, some, some of these districts, instead of letting them done by the politicians in the state. That'd be a great help. And we should try to spread that idea from state to state so that we get rid of this gerrymandering and perhaps get some moderates elected and some districts where moderates can be elected. And that would be, um, that would be extremely helpful and extremely important. Money's, you know, very, very difficult. Very, very difficult because of the court decisions. But there are other ways to do it, and there are other people who are working in the problem, and frankly, it seems to me the court is going to change at some point. And I think we should make sure these cases and financial law is, are reviewed, because nobody can tell me that any sensible person would think that Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Washington, any of those people would tolerate people buying the democracy just because they have a lot of money. So it seems to me that if we continue to bring cases to the court, the courts, like all courts, will change. Some of these people will retire, others will get appointed. And every one of these decisions, by the way, was a five to four decision, starting with Buckley Vallejo. So the idea, perhaps, of being able to, to turn them around may be not only viable, but, um, but maybe, even, maybe even hopeful. So we've got to do that. We've got to continue to compromise. We've got to continue to try and, try and make the democracy better. Because every single problem we've got is eventually going to come to Congress. Whether it's more money for the sciences that we need, whether it's this, whether it's that, it's all going to come eventually to the Congress. And we've got to have the best people. Now, this is the final point. When I was young, my generation was talked to by John F. Kennedy. And what he said to us was, the most important thing you can do with your life is to go into government in one way or another. Nothing is more important. And a tremendous amount of my generation did. I'd say the top half of my co college class, every one of them went in government at some way or other in some, at some point or other. I don't know for the students who are listening, I don't know how many of them are even thinking of government. Because of what's out there, because of the reputation, because of the Congress, because of the fact that you can't get anything done, there are so many more useful things you must feel you can do with your life. And yet if you don't go into government, and your friends don't go into government, and your compatriots don't go into government, who is going to go into government? Who is going to make these decisions which affect the future and education and the safety net and foreign policy? And so many other things that are absolutely essential for this country. Who is going to do it? The Greeks said, you know, the Greeks in that first democracy said, you know, the penalty for not taking part in government is that you'll be governed by your inferiors. Think about that. This is my great concern, and this is my great worry, because, you know, all this can be fixed, I'm convinced, because people eventually cause these problems. So people can solve the problems, but not unless they get involved. We're in a terrible cycle now. You know, less good people are going into politics. Less people are voting. Nobody goes into these primaries. So people with money and influence can go in there and do what they want to do. And with these districts spread to where they are, they can get their way. And that's what's happening. As I say, we get more right, more left, and no compromises when everything good in this country was formed by a compromise. The only time we didn't get a compromise done was slavery. And it was a war. That was the only one. Everything else important in this country was settled by a compromise. So I think we're in trouble. I think we're in deep trouble as a country, but I think we can be fixed. But it's got to be fixed with the involvement of people. They've got to care about moderates. They've got to find some people who are sensible to get into the legislature in both parties and into the Congress. And they've got to take part themselves, and hopefully our brightest, brightest and our best will once again 
Look at government as something that's exciting, somewhere you can have a life of consequence. Sometimes you can do things that people will remember and help the rest and will help somebody's, everybody else's life. And you can do that in a democracy. That's the exciting thing. But I've, I remember a story we used to tell in New Jersey. It was, a, it was a day actually very much like this. It was a boat off the coast. And through the fog, they could see some lights vaguely right straight ahead of them. And then they saw the blinking. And the blinking said, move. Somebody agrees to starboard. And the ship looked at it and looked back. Would you move five degrees to port? And nobody moved, and the light started getting closer. So I said, you've got to move five degrees. And the other one said, no, you move five degrees. And finally, the guy got enough money. He said, I'm a captain of a battleship. I'm ordering you to move five degrees to the starboard. And came back, I'm an ensign, sir, but I'm on a lighthouse, <laughs> and you better move. Uh, uh, you know, we're, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> we're headed for the rocks. We're headed for the rocks, and we're the ones who have to move. We're the ones who have to do it better. We're the ones who have to get involved. And that means people who care. Thank you very much.